Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokos Mystery. This will be part 359. We're continuing with our lesson title, Reality Construct. Amen. Praise the this Lord. Will be part 3. <clears throat> We've been talking about spiritual influence, starting in the spiritual makeup of man ultimately influencing and or controlling him. But mm. Everything starts in the spiritual realm not in the physical realm because man is a spiritual being in a physical environment. On that note, scripture teaches the enemy Knowing the vulnerabilities of a person's soul will seek to place in his thoughts dream thoughts. Now the enemy will come in one of two guises. He will come either as an allurer or as a tormentor. One of the two. And dependent upon the receptivity of the mental state of the victim, the enemy will intensify the influence that he will note is received. He will place thoughts of allurement. If that's not going to elicit a positive response, he will place thoughts of torment. The torment aspect basically is more successful than the alluring aspect from a human perspective. <clears throat> if the soul is vulnerable and entertains the torment aspect, it translates into fear, phobia. <clears throat> the fear Receptivity, then, will translate to the enemy placing a spirit in the life of the individual, and the spirit will build a construct of fear in the mind of the vulnerable individual. The mind becomes an open arena to construct a belief system based on fear. I'm going to see some examples of that. Turn to 2 Timothy, 1st chapter, verse 7. Second Timothy, first chapter, verse seven. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Now this word fear comes from the Greek term delia, which means literally timidity, cowardice, a spirit that <coughs> will translate avoidance of things in the life. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we see God does not give the spirit, the enemy gives the spirit. When the mind is open to receive its influence. Which brings us to the next principle. 
scripture teaches, the spirit of fear, once entering the life, will cause the person to live in restriction, in isolation, in rejection yes. of things that would be blessings from God. We're going to see an example of this. Numbers, the 13th chapter, verse 1 to 2. Numbers 13, <clears throat> 1 to 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give, which I give unto the children of Israel. For every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. So <clears throat> what happens is <clears throat> out of each tribe, the most able individual, the one who has the most influence over that tribe, is selected to go into the promised land for a period of 40 days. To scout the land out, survey what it's all about, and uh, bring back a report. The Lord emphasizes to Moses, I've already given this to you. It's been promised to you. All you have to do now is send men out to verify what's there before you go into it. Go down to verses 32 to 33, same chapter, Numbers 13. <clears throat> so come back after. 40 days, and report, and they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come out of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so were we in their sight. So to give this report based off of their conclusion, we can't deal with this because the people in this land will wipe us out. We estimated ourselves, and it says our sight. So they're giving you the understanding of their belief system based off of their observation, based off of what they come to a conclusion. Ten men out of twelve. Of course, Caleb and, Je and uh, Joshua have a different viewpoint. But this is what we want to focus on. Where do they get their conclusion from? Numbers 14. Verse 24. Numbers 14, verse 24. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and has followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and the seed shall possess it. Caleb had another spirit, which means that these individuals give a report from what their soul has been in contact with that basically gives them a subjective evaluation of what their physical eyes have seen. It's a spirit that gives them their reality. Fear will distort 
perception. The ten look at the giants. The giants probably haven't even seen them. They see the giants and they come to an evaluation. We can't deal with these individuals. Look at them. They'll wipe us out. Joshua and Caleb say, no, we'll wipe them out because God's with us. Let's go on and do this. No, no, no. You'll get the whole nation wiped out. They bring this report back and it says that the whole nation broke down and uh, went into a, a mindset of fear, a total fear of psychosis until YHVH comes down and makes his declaration. So the fifth spirit makes them forget that YH3H is actually YH3H and not some guy down the street. Well, what it will do, they didn't forget YH3H, but what the spirit will do is to give you a distorted perception. Yeah, YH3H did that in the past, but we don't think he can deal with okay. this now. Interesting. They don't deny his existence, but it will give you a distortion that pertains to him. And this is what you find in organized religion today, the spirit of fear on the part of the leadership. Mm. Uh, they refuse to be bold. They refuse to stand into, against opposition. The church is not respected. People could care less. Christians aren't given the reason for what they believe in. They have no foundation whatsoever. There is a spirit of timidity, cowardice. Yes. Yes. The spirit of Delia. Of who? Delia. Delia, okay. That's the Greek term mm -hmm. for spirit of fear. We see it ourselves with our own eyes over and over again. All the time. Mm -hmm. You make a suggestion, it's totally uh, taken down and tromped into the ground. You can't do it because it's spirit of fear. But let's go on. Scripture teaches prolonged focus. Prolonged focus on one's problems under the spirit of fear will draw other spirits who will literally undermine the mind with tormenting thoughts of depression consistently. Once the mind is open to doubt, once the mind is open to <clears throat> anything less than confidence, the spirit of fear will influence that mind to a greater and greater and greater degree. And in that respect, the life will reflect the spirit of fear. It reaches a point, instead of expanding, moving uh, boldly, and being in motion, it comes to a state of inertia. It is put into a box in which it will no longer operate in any objective evaluation in the life. You take a look at Christians around here. They don't want to know anything. They're not interested in truth. They are consistently focusing on what? Their problems. Their grievances. The life becomes focused on the self, which is the enemy's stock and trade. It's what he relishes. Get the individual to focus on himself and he focuses on his limitations. Mm. So would you describe that as mitigating the faith of that person? Yes. I, I, I describe it as destroying the faith of the person. To the point where there is no look, there is no Yes, yes. He becomes totally under the control of the influence. Someone we know, whose name doesn't need to be mentioned, is in exactly that state. To the degree that she does not believe that the God in her is greater than the fear of spirit outside of her. Sure. And, mm -hmm. as you know, has destroyed sure. uh, her beliefs as no faith. Yeah. That's what it's designed to do. Mm. Puts a person in a state of subjectivity, not objectivity. They see things from a distortion. That's a person with a, a neurosis, psychosis. Yep. Yep. Uh, people with quote-unquote mental aberrations. Mm -hmm. They see things from a distortion rather than objective. You can't, you can't 
give them uh, objective advice, counseling. They're not open to it because they've shut down objectivity. They reach the stage where the only thing that they're receptive to are things that they agree with right. on a negative perspective. Mm. They go into a state of uh, total uh, isolation and they're in captivity, they're in bondage to the circumstances, to the spirit that's influencing them and they take their marching orders in that respect. Sure. I didn't realize the truth of what you're saying until I saw it with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. Sand. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go on. As long as the mind is focusing in that direction, our thoughts of doubt, depression, negativity, they're going to be brought more and more into bondage to that. Whatever it happens to be, whatever circumstance they're facing, they're going to only be able to see to the parameters of the circumstance. They'll never be able to see beyond it because the spirit of fear dictates the parameters of the thoughts of the individual. Instead of going outward, they go inward. Mm. But this whole thing is reversed when the thoughts are focused on the greatness of God, who God is, what God has done, and what God is capable of doing. <clears throat> when the thoughts focus on the greatness of God and away from the circumstance, the soul then becomes free. I'm going to repeat that. When the thoughts are focused on the greatness of God and away from the circumstance, get off the earth. Then the soul becomes free and God will address the circumstance. We free the Lord to change the conditions that we're dealing with. But isn't part of that this spirit um, activation include <clears throat> the fear to be released from that bondage? Of course. Of course. Everything that that person focuses on, as long as he's can, willing to continue to focus in that direction, he's going to focus in a state of captivity, subjectivity. Reverse the thoughts, focus on God, you reverse the condition that's taking place, and you allow the Lord ultimately, ultimately to enter into the circumstance to change it. Amen. We see example of this. Turn to Psalms 17, 4 to 19. God operates in the spiritual realm when we invite him in to our situation, our circumstance. Psalm 17. We're going to read verses 4 to 19. Yeah, Psalms 18, 4 to 19. Thank you. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. So David is focusing on the circumstance. 
Now David had a unique capacity. He could detect things happening in the spiritual realm as well as things happening in the physical realm and he writes about this. He could detect, he writes a lot of depressive things that are happening to his soul in addition to his physical because David had a connection with the soul most people never enter into. Right. And so he writes about things that are happening in the spiritual realm that are affecting him as well as things that are happening in the physical realm that are affecting him, both positive and negative. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me or walled me in. Basically, he's looking here from a negative perspective. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth, devoured coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. Now what is being said here? Is David embellishing things? Is he exaggerating things? <clears throat> if he were, this wouldn't be in the Bible because it would not please God. He would not allow this to be written in that way. He's not embellishing. What he's doing is describing things happening in the spiritual realm on the part of YHVH. Notice what he says <clears throat> in verse 4. The sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell. He's talking about things happening in the spiritual realm that are affecting him both in his soul and in his physical to a point where he's now in captivity of depression uh, unspeakable. He cries out to the Lord. He's shifting his thoughts from a circumstance to God by crying out to the Lord, believing that the Lord is going to hear him. And he says, he heard me. Now, the Lord he's talking about here is white VH, but you can see Elohim is also involved. Drop down to verse 11. He made darkness his secret place. This pavilion round about him were dark waters and dark clouds, thick clouds of the skies. White VH operates in the darkness. Elohim does not. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest, this is a yon, this is Elohim. The highest gave his voice. Hail and coals of fire. So the highest refers to, he sends YHVH in the spiritual realm to aid David. David is in communion with his soul and he's receiving changes in the spiritual realm because <clears throat> the constructs that have been built by the Luciferians to keep him in bondage are being taken down by YHVH. When he talks about the earth trembling, he's talking about all these things happening, he's talking about spiritual imprisonment, spiritual constructs that are in the spiritual realm to trap him, keep him in bondage, make him a consistent captive to the spiritual influences. They're all going to be destroyed. Yes? How did David come upon such wisdom, some, such spiritual comprehension? Well, he talks about it. He says, on my bed I meditate. I commune with my soul. We can all do that. If he be an Old Testament, Old Covenant, saint can do it, so can we. So, uh, it's interesting, he's a king. Mm -hmm. 
but he, he's also a prophet. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's an interesting combination, sanctified by God. Yes. Uh, but David got get to that place willingly. He dedicated him life, his life to the Lord, opened himself up to revelation knowledge, and was able to take advantage of his spiritual makeup, unlike most humans. He could take his mind all the way back to his origins, to memory. He writes about things that people don't understand what he's saying in the Psalms. Yes. Again, Mr. Jones, he's experiencing, he's speaking out the fear that he is, his soul is feeling. Yes. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit. No. He has YHVH, but YHVH can't give him comprehension of a spiritual, of a, well, I don't know, you're going to have to answer that. It's just amazing how David is rich with potential understanding and goes and then goes through and puts it in words for us. Yes. So he's obviously a prophet. Yes. But he's, <coughs> he's not a priest, but he's a king. Yes. Um, yes, he is part of the priesthood as well. Or no, he's a, right. he's a he's king. A but he has what's called the anointing. Right, and that's what the okay. And. Uh, in that he is taking advantage of revelation knowledge, which is available to anybody that wants to go in that direction. But mm -hmm. well, how would he find it? What, is it written down somewhere? No, it's his soul. <laughs> it's in his soul. He's all he's doing. See, I know where he can go. Allowing in. himself to connect with his spiritual side. Right. So his, uh, but he's clearly also praying to YFH and or Elohim to give him. The to because he understands from a spiritual perspective mm -hmm. he has insight into the workings of the spiritual right. reality right. and he makes his connection with the spiritual side consistently growing in greater and greater understanding of what he's experienced on the physical plane starts in the spiritual plane and that God rules the spiritual plane if you allow him to rule in your life, he'll free you up. Yes. Is it Elohim that makes him king in the New Jerusalem? Yeah, yeah. He, he, David it's was not chosen. YHVH, it's Elohim. No, David was chosen by Elohim. Uh, YHVH chose Saul. Mm -hmm. Mistake. Uh, <clears throat> Elohim from eternity chose David at the onset of the human race. When you read one Psalms 139, he tells you, uh, he saw my substance yeah. when the race was created. Yeah, yeah. And in his book, all things were written. David saw in the spiritual realm, he was able to go back and understand his origins. So yeah. if he knows in his book, all things are written, how does he know that? Because in connection with Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> and the quick bring you back to Reality Construct Lesson 1. You said that <coughs> the Prototokos are not subject to having um, pseudo-reality representation of themselves in the spiritual realm. What about before they are born again? Oh, okay, what was, the, what was the statement? The we, were talking was about, we were talking about the representation of every living human on the earth mm -hmm. in the pseudo realities, the reality constructs built by the Luciferians. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I asked you whether that was true, mm -hmm. they had that same representation of Protodicus members. You said no. No. And I'm asking you, does that include the Protodicus member before they're born again? No. So, oh, so the born again experience is what removes them from that representation. They were never in that representation because Elohim from eternity had them shielded. Okay. Ephesians tells you when we were dead in trespasses and right. sins, he had already made provision for us. So the answer is no, even before they were born again, they still wouldn't no. do that. Okay. What happens, the enemy can influence in the, in the physical realm. You can, you can, you can encounter things that are disastrous in the physical realm, but your spiritual is always going to be protected right. because you are going to be under 
the protection of Elohim until the XY axis crosses in your life. And so therefore, if that same Patroclus person, before they were born again, chose to uh, send them their spirit out into the astral uh, plane, they would still be protected. They wouldn't go that direction. I don't think so either. But if they were that stupid, what would happen? No, they wouldn't be allowed they to. Would, they wouldn't be that stupid. No, no. Because they wouldn't be allowed to. They wouldn't right? be allowed to. Right. Uh, you're protected. You're not going to be allowed to expose your spirit to any kind of Luciferian influence. Mm. Elohim would not allow. Matter of fact, in our my younger days, we used to talk about astral projection and mm. all the rest of that. Read up about <coughs> it. But uh, understood. We understood from the beginning. So you don't go in that direction. Yeah. The Holy Spirit will quicken you in a hot minute. No, don't. Even if before you accept, before you're born again, you know that that's not the path to go down. That happened to me many, many, many years ago. It's not for you. Yeah. Very interesting. Yes, yes. But let's go on. <clears throat> Verse uh, 14, Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out the lightnings and discomforted them. Then the channels of waters were, were seen, and the foundations of the world were discovered at thy rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of thy nostrils. He sent from above and took me, drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. He's talking about those in the spiritual realm, those in the physical realm. We're all dealt with by YHPH at the direction of Elohim because he cried out in faith. Got his mind off of his circumstance right, the onto the Lord, the greatness of the Lord, that broke the strength of the binding influence of fear and enabled him to step forward and bring his soul into a state of living expectancy. Matter of fact, there's psalm, the psalms that we talk to his soul. He says, why you cast down my soul? Focus on the Lord. Mm. He speaks to his mm. spiritual makeup. But I wonder then why towards the end of his life did he forget these truths these gems of wisdom and allow himself to be persuaded by the, the gods, I guess, of his various wives. That wasn't David, that was Solomon. That's uh, right. No, I'm talking about Solomon. Yes, you're right. Yeah, no, David never went that direction. After mm. his thing with Bathsheba, he came right back and he was walking the straight and narrow. Right. right. So why did Solomon uh, allow that to happen? Because Solomon didn't have the total commitment that David had, number one. So commitment's the key. Sure. Mm -hmm. He had earthly wisdom, but he never pursued spiritual wisdom. Mm. And he reached a point where he isolated himself because of the influences he allowed to come into his life. He did things that had he, he would have declared between the time he wrote the book of Proverbs and the time he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and went downhill from there, he would have called himself a fool. Right. Because he was guilty of doing what he said in Proverbs, never leave wisdom. Mm -hmm. Keep her close to you. But that's exactly what he did. <clears throat> well, let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the Prototokus saint is directed to discipline, discipline, discipline his thought stream to reject any thoughts that are not in harmony with the Word of God. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself dwelling on things that cause you anxiety, uh, doubt, uncertainty, you're entertaining thoughts that come from the Luciferian stream. Sure. And it becomes subtle. But, well, the enemy is shrewd. What he'll do is get you to focus on your problem and focusing on how you can deal with your problem. And then begin to put doubts, your inability to deal with the problem, until it gets you to a point where you've got a fixation on that parameter of what you're experiencing, and then you're putting yourself into isolation. When you put yourself into isolation, you're putting yourself into a state of inertia, a state of captivity. 
to a particular thought, a particular belief. When you do that, then you're putting yourself under Luciferian influence. So that's what creates the obsessive thoughts. It's a circle, isn't it? Once you enter into that, and you it's continue a trap, to it's a snare, it's a yeah. construct designed to do just that. Have you focusing on the parameters of your circumstance and nothing beyond that? Yeah. And when you do that, and you realize the inadequacy, you realize the uh, lack of any illumination in being able to progress toward a solution, then the enemy just begins to pour on the coals. You begin to see and become more and more frustrated. You begin to lose objectivity. The, the, the problem begins to become your whole focus after a while. <clears throat> the, the, the solution to that is when I say discipline, you have to reach a stage in your own mind where you say, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling limited, but I know that I don't need to stay depressed and limited. I'm getting out of this snare by, number one, praising God, number two, inviting God in the situation. Focus on God. Whatever it takes, don't be prideful. Mm -hmm. Start praising Him. Humble yourself. That will break the bondage. And immediately, what will happen when the bondages are broken, you're going to see your situation from a different perspective. It's not limited. You begin to see other things because God will give you illumination because you enable Him to step in right away to deal with the circumstance. God's not going to deal with a situation where a person is keeping Him outside. I don't care how close you're walking with sure. the Lord. He gives you free will. What does that mean? That means you have the ability to get close to Him or to distance yourself from Him. He'll allow you to do that. You go into a problem, you keep him distant, he'll allow you to stay in that problem, which the enemy is orchestrating. Yes, yes. Because as a son, we should know better. Particularly prototokis. Mm -hmm. And until we apply the authority that he's given us, he's not going to do a thing. But allow us to continue in that direction. We see this time and time again with David. David realized, hey, why am I, why am I treading this water? Hey, uh, Lord, <clears throat> help. Lord, I need you. That's old covenant. The new covenant, you're another servant crying out to him or his son. As the son, the scripture says, come boldly into his presence. Amen. Glorifying him as your father. That immediately breaks the bondage. Enables the father to enter into your situation and begin to change, make the changes. And the first thing that you get from that is that there's a joy in your spirit. Well, you would get the impression from the state of the church that nobody in the church has ever done that. Nobody. Okay. Turn to the Gospel of James. Yeah. First chapter. James first chapter verse two to four. <clears throat> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now this flies in the face of human thinking. It flies directly in the face of human thinking. Who are you going to identify when you go into a problem? The human or the prototypes? <coughs> when you go into a problem, he says, count it all joy. That doesn't mean you don't wait to get happy in the physical about your circumstances. It's never going to happen. 
What it means is when you enter into the spiritual reality of God, immediately you're going to feel joy. Because you've transited out of a pseudo-reality into a true reality. Peace, love, and joy. Where does the joy come from? Because the joy comes from knowing that you have entered into the presence of the Father, who's far greater than any problem you're facing, and at the same time, it's the understanding that the Father's going to deal with this. Thank you, Father. Amen. In the spiritual realm, you operate outside of time. And in that respect, you're not waiting for the Father to do anything, because waiting connotes a span of time. Your spirit operates outside of time. The knowledge that the Father is going to deal with it transcends time. It is though it already happened in your spirit. And you're thanking Him. In the physical, it hasn't happened. But that's not important. What's important is the spiritual comprehension. You have a joy, and a joy is a strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You can endure anything through the strength. Paul says, I can deal with anything, God, through the, the strength that Jesus Christ gives gives me. When I... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. When I crossed the bridge of that comprehension that you're speaking out now, I was amazed that the problem that I was so concerned about just you know, five minutes before... Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> let's, let's go. Exactly. What, what have we got to deal exactly. with? And from that point, it's a completely different uh, perspective. Yes, totally. yes. You're, you're on another, another level now. Mm. And you're in motion now. And in that respect, what happens to you is it doesn't matter whether the problem is dealt with now. What matters is that you know it's going to be dealt with. And that confidence will enable you to even forget about the problem. Yes. You're going in the direction and next thing you know the problem's taken care of. Wow, how did Praise that happen? Lord. Praise the Lord. That's the secret of being a victorious overcomer. You don't stay in the problem. You transit. Knowing that the problem's going to be dealt with, you got better things to do. I say basically, do you determine in your own mind that you are not going to be limited by this human condition because it's not real? It is an illusion. Nothing in this world lasts forever. You know, some things may endure for a long time. Everything changes. And when you begin to depend upon the Father, the change comes quickly because there's no need for you to have to endure all the fallen wants is your faith knowing that it's going to happen. When he has that, that happens. James here is talking about this whole situation of enduring. Verse 3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. What is the word patience? Patience, the translated patience is endurance. Are you willing to endure? But let patience or endurance here for a perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. When you reach a stage of comprehending that you are willing to endure whatever it is, knowing that the Father is going to take care of it, you've passed the test. It is only when a person waffles and wavers and is so caught up with the problem that he can't do anything else that he stays in the problem until he learns the lesson that he's supposed to learn. This is part of wisdom. It says, uh, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If you want to understand why you're going through something, God will give you the understanding ultimately if you expect him to. A lot of people are so busy going through stuff that they don't give God a chance to give them the understanding. He's going to give us the understanding when we're no longer focused on the problem, we're focused on Him. Sure. Verse 6 says, But they am asking faith, nothing wavering. Yes, and, and he talks about... Uh, let's, let's take a look at that. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything 
of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But what does he mean by a double-minded man? Well, what he's talking about is an individual that operates in the physical sometime and in the spiritual other times. Right. <clears throat> if a person is operating in the physical, he's operating in time. Mm. Operating in time, then you're going to be limited and your expectancy is going to be limited. You operate in the spirit, time doesn't matter. Time is irrelevant because you know that the Father is going to do what He promised that He's going to do regardless of whether it's a long time or a short time. So you're not focused on time. You're rejoicing in knowing that it's going to happen. <clears throat> and you are focusing beyond the problem, beyond the circumstance. You're no longer limited to the circumstance. You are in a higher plateau focusing on progression. You're in motion. Always stay in motion. Never let anything slow you down, stop you, or put you in retrograde motion. Keep moving. Paul talks about we're in a race, running a race. A race is in motion toward a goal. Christians allow themselves to be slowed down, deviated, or even go backward. Never, never, never allow that to happen. It's not the will of God. Never has been, never will be. It's the will of the enemy. Get your thoughts off of the prime directive, your calling. Put your thoughts on things that distract. Mm -hmm. And the enemy has a beautiful chance yes. of putting the individual in captivity. In closing, Scripture teaches <clears throat> the prototokist saint is directed to discipline his thought stream to reject any thoughts that are not in harmony with the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 4 to 5. We'll be closing with this. The injunction is, do not allow yourself to focus from a human perspective. Because if you do, it will limit you. It will put you in retrograde motion. It will <coughs> keep the Father from being able to do what He wants to do in your life. 2 Corinthians 10th chapter 4-5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What does that mean? How does a stronghold manifest? A stronghold manifests when a willing mind allows the enemy to build a fortification in which a captivity takes place in the life. He's not talking about pulling down your stronghold because you don't have one if you're focusing on <coughs> bringing your thought stream totally in line and harmony with the Word of God you will never have a, a stronghold built up in you I'm talking about pulling down somebody else's stronghold when that person is in captivity and they're willing to be open to receive words of wisdom from you and apply those words of wisdom, you've pulled down that person's stronghold. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself among, against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When he says casting down imaginations, that comes from a Greek term logisimos, which means reasonings. A person on the human level is going to reason. And if you reason on a human level, you're reasoning subjectively. You reason subjectively, you're right in the enemy's territory. We reason spiritually. Spiritual comprehension puts you on a high level beyond the physical. It gives you the understanding of truth. You reason on the level of truth and you reason objectively you can go right focus right to the part that you need to focus on and apply with the principle you need to focus on by accurate objective rationale reasoning 
reasoning on the physical level, number one, the physical is always temporary. The physical is subjective, elusive. You stay on the physical level and try to apply spiritual principles, you go into bondage every time. So he's talking about casting down human reasonings in every high thing, something that tries to exalt itself above what you know to be the truth of God, you immediately dismiss it. It has no ability to influence your thinking. It exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, you make all thoughts subject to the truth of revelation knowledge that's in you. Satan cannot, in that respect, bring you into anything that will that will threaten you, that will put you in bondage, or even slow you down. Because every thought that he puts in your thought stream, you've captured through the power of Christ. And ultimately, he's going to leave you alone. Because you're not an asset that uh, is productive to him. <laughs> he's going to go and look for another target of opportunity that he may have was success with. Mm. Now, I like verse 6. It says, And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What does this mean? When you reach the stage of domination through Christ, then the words that you speak affect the lives of others. When you see things that are taking place that are contrary to the will and the way of God, you speak truth in that situation it will demolish the constructs of the Luciferians in that life if it's received. Mm. And you set that person free, you are going about freeing the captives because you yourself are free. And it goes on and on and on. That way. You run into a foolish person doesn't want to hear what you have to say, you just go on to somebody else. Sure. 